So um, I see there's a question from uh, Nicola Green. Do you have any issues with contractors not building to your specs? If I said no, I will be lying. We know this is always a problem in uh, construction around. So of course we do face problems with uh, some people not complying to the specs, but if we notice a tank is leaking or there's an issue with the tank, we always decline to do our installation until that is corrected. And uh, going in the last recent years and going forward, we have also identified the good civil engineers and contractors who've understood how our tank is built. And so we are sort of partnering with them. And when we get a new project, we recommend to a client that um, we have worked with this civil engineer and contractor and they've been able to do a tank. So we would either recommend that so that the client gives the contract to them or uh, we, yeah, we have to do a lot of inspection. So yeah, so Nicola Green, I could unmute you. And um, if you feel like you would like to speak because I'm seeing you have still written, oh, sorry, where is Nicola Green? I would just wanna unmute her because she wrote that question and she followed it up with something. So Nicola, I'm not, oh, <clears throat> Nicola. Sorry, I don't know what's with the button. Nicola Green? Yes, hello. Feel free to add something because I see you, you've raised a very valid point and uh, I've answered. I don't know if you feel answered, but you may add something more. No, that answer is perfect. I was just wondering. Um, I see it as a risk, but I definitely see it being making your business model more straightforward. So. I was just wondering how you handle that. I'm sure it evolves and improves over time. Yeah. No, so so the reason in evolvement is that we have identified good people that have done our tanks perfectly uh, because I'm a mechanical engineer. So, and, and my team is mainly mechanical and not having a, a, a senior civil engineer in in-house in our company, then it would not be right to say that we can execute civil works. So that's why we always have to partner with the experts. As you see, it's a combination of um, civil works. Uh, it's a combination of electricals and mechanical work. So we really have to work together with those different uh, experts to finally deliver a working project. But I know to the client, sometimes it feels like, why am I engaging these different people? So it may look logistical, but it's the right thing to do rather than pretending that we can do everything and that's not our speciality. Yeah, sounds very smart. Okay. Are you joining us from Kenya? Um, uh, yeah, I usually live in Kenya, but I, I came home during the lockdown, so I'm in Ireland. Okay. Thank you for joining. So I see another question. Uh, Lucy was wondering if this system works also in areas where they have long drop or pit latrines where a deep hole is constructed. For example, in the northern part of the country, you find people digging new pit latrine once the earlier one is filled and there seem to be no honey sucker. So Ahmed Mohammed, if I may want to explain this recycling bit, in a pit latrine, there is no water for us to reclaim. So this system serves people who are using water, like the, we are trying to reclaim the water that you use to shower, the water that you use to wash your laundry, the water that you use to wash your plates, we are, trying, we are reclaiming that water back. So if you think of a pit latrine, there is no water that is used, so there is no water to reclaim. Maybe the only water is the moisture content of the fecal matter, but that's not really, we, we can't say in a pit latrine there is water to reclaim. But uh, for the northern people who do not have flushing toilets or running water, uh, I personally have a sister consultancy where we can provide a toilet called uh, an Envirolu. It's a toilet that runs on the sun and the wind. It's South African, but uh, we are the local, I'm the local consultant around for it. It would work well for such people because the Envirolu doesn't require that you keep digging. It never fills up because the sun and the wind breaks down the waste. It's shallow, it's not even a meter deep. So I could get your contacts and uh, 
email you my email and we can talk further. Although at the moment we are not able to deliver an environment because of the COVID, things have closed down and importing from South Africa is not uh, possible at this point in time, but it's something we can work together in future. So now that there seem to be no more questions, I think I will move on to the next presentation. And uh, I just have to pause recording a bit. Okay. And I think there are people who've raised their hands. Okay, let me just have a look before I resume presentation. So where are the chats? There are people that have raised their hands. If you can see them, you are a host, you can unmute them to speak. And then remember to mute them. Uh, they see there is one more question. Um, do, how do you handle scenarios with existing apartments set up with a septic tank, but now wants to upgrade to a wastewater treatment plant? This is from David Onyango. Uh, Troy, I yes. will let you speak because I will not speak alone. <laughs> Please handle that question. <laughs> Converting okay, fine. a septic tank at an apartment, which is a possibility. Okay, so we have two ways of working on that. The first way is we have to come and do a site survey and know um, the volumes and the size of the existing septic tank and if it can handle the entire apartment. If it can, then what we do is we involve our civil engineer, um, rather our um, contractor to come and help us work on on the tank just to modify it to meet the volumes and the required design that we will give and if it's not enough then the second way is just to design a whole new tank and maybe incorporate the existing septic to work as either a storage chamber or as the first chamber like the to act as the receiving chamber. So those are the two ways that we can help you convert into our system. Okay, I think I can unmute David because if someone asks a question, it's good to hear if they are answered or they, or they have more. So David, please feel free to ask if it's not clear. Yeah, yeah, um, hi, hi. Hello, David. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, uh, the question has been answered, but partly. So, um, in a scenario where, okay, of course you've said that uh, you first have to assess the tank if it's sufficient to handle the, the, the apartment setup or whichever setup that there is. So, um, what if in a scenario where the tank is not enough here, yeah? the, the, the existing septic one, one, the existing septic tank is not sufficient to handle the wastewater coming in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but this plant really, really wants to do a wastewater treatment plant because maybe for one reason or another, they are either exhausting too much or, uh, yeah, actually that would be the only reason why a client would want to put up a wastewater treatment plant in an already, in an already existing tank, in an already existing site. Yeah, if you so, want to save on the exhaust cost. Yeah, so uh, in a scenario where the the existing septic tank is not sufficient, how would you, how would you advise this client? And secondly, um, this question is uh, the question. What is the question? Yeah, uh, secondly, uh, now the, the the site is already existing and the septic tank is uh, in use. How do you involve a civil engineer? How do how how do you put the uh, uh, let's say in a scenario where the tank is sufficient? Now, how do you go about it uh, using that septic tank involving uh, construction uh, to go on while uh, there's still wastewater coming in? Because I believe the apart the apartments are already occupied, so there's water always coming in. How do you handle that, or um, how do you handle that? Okay, so David, I think I will take that. Uh, actually, it's a very valid concern because converting an apartment that is already occupied and the space is limited is quite some logistics in it. So first of all, let's assume the space is sufficient. Let's say we have uh, surveyed your site, your septic tank seems to be sufficient and it is possible to convert it. The logistics behind it is first, we need to stop 
the further flow of sewer into the system because we need human beings to get in to do a modification. So it means we cannot have sewage coming in because the people that uh, the civil contractor engages are human beings and safety is first and you cannot work with sewer flowing in. So in a situation that we have experienced before, it's either you have an alternative, you have to first empty the tank totally, the septic tank. And then it needs to be cleaned by the people of water bowsers, they are cleaners who clean the tank. It needs to be cleaned, aired, to allow the ammonia and all the gases to escape before people can start working in. So one way, it's either you bring in mobile toilets for your existing people to stop using the septic tank, or the other option would be to quickly uh, make, a, every day you call an exhauster, because if the sewage is exhausted, first you exhaust it totally, you do a cleanup, and then allow the contractor to enter and sort of create a partition wall. So we have the first chamber just receiving and being emptied every day as the other three chambers are being modified. So that is one way. The other way, which we have ever experienced with one of our clients, uh, somewhere in Kitengela, uh, if the public health catches up with you, because we have ever had that incident that um, an apartment in Kitengela was polluting and discharging raw sewage to the neighboring compound, which happened to be a school. So the school reported that to the public health and the public health came, gave a notice to the client and charged them a fine. And all the tenants had to move out until, until he could find a solution for his wastewater management. And that's how he reached out to EcoCycle. So there's that costly option of having to tell your people to move out for the period of the project, if it's three months or two months, that translates into revenue losses because you're not able to collect rent for those three months or for the project lead time. So that is the option if the, the septic tank is sufficient to be converted. I will go into the details of why, again, it might be a challenge to convert a septic tank because our treatment plant has very specific dimensioning. The depth, the surface area is very crucial to be able to attain maximum aeration. So there's a certain depth that is not acceptable because it means the water column will be too high and the aeration will not be sufficient. So we have very specific dimensioning and we can only convert a septic tank that is very close to our dimension. If it meets the minimum uh, water height, then it meets the overall length and the aeration chamber is the most crucial. If we can make sure that assumes our required uh, surface area and water height so that we can achieve uh, optimal aeration of the sewage. So I think that explains, answers you, if it is possible. Now, if you do not, if your septic tank is too small as per what we would need, then that's a design we cannot go on with because it's going on with a design that will fail because we need a specific surface area and a specific, specific volume, water depth or tank depth to be able to achieve optimal treatment. So if it doesn't meet the bare minimum, it's a project that we are not likely to go ahead with unless you are able to identify more space or to bring in plastic tanks, maybe to hold some of the volume. So it, it has to be made to work to meet the minimum volume and surface areas that are needed for optimal aeration. David? Yeah. <clears throat> so are we somewhere now? Yeah, 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 completely. Okay. So, yeah, Troy, mm -hmm. do we have another hand up? Troy? So if there is no other hand up, I see there's there are one. new people. Sorry? There is one, Dennis Olo. Dennis Olo. Okay, yes. you have unmuted him, then he can speak. Let me unmute. Okay. I have my cursor on, on his... Uh... I'm not being able to unmute. Maybe he also needs to unmute himself because I'm clicking unmute, but it's still muted. Um, Dennis, hello. I, can't, I also can't unmute you. Okay. Now yeah. I have unmuted. Okay, okay Dennis. Dennis. And, uh, I, I have a question. Uh, 
how do you people ensure that uh, the Nairobi facilities stay alive? We can't hear you. I'm asking. Hello. Yes, yes. you're very yes. Yes. Speaker. Question is, hello. Yes. Yes, it's better now. How, how, how do you ensure that uh, the aerobic bacteria stay alive in most cases, especially, let's say, let me use an example. Huh? Uh, in areas where maybe it's maybe a school that is very far away uh, from the areas where they can be served with the centralized WWTP. How do you ensure that this bacteria stays alive, especially maybe during this period when now this, the, the, the schools are closed or something? Because if they are, uh, the aerobic bacteria are not alive, then the system definitely turns into a septic tank. Okay, that's a good well, question. So, how do uh -huh. they get their BOD? How do they get the BOD, which is their food, for them to uh, keep alive? So the, the one way that we keep our systems alive is by making sure the compressor is still on. Because the, the mm. compressor is the one that sucks in oxygen from the environment and continues mm. to elevate. So uh, I have not seen a case of, like in our schools, even if schools close, there's always the maintenance people or like a few 10 people. So in that case, the few 10 people that are still bringing in sewage into the system and with our continued mm. aeration, the biomass continues to survive with the only disadvantage that at that point in time, you're not able to get the same amount of treated water as you'd have gotten if you had the full capacity. So the aeration continues to keep the bacteria alive. The only time our biomass will not survive is if we have power problems, like the compressor has no power supply and there is no aeration for more than three days continuous. At that point in time, the bacteria will die because there, there is no aeration. And uh, what we have to do is sort of evacuate and restart either by bringing in a good biomass from another of our systems that has a good biomass in the aeration chamber. We always restart using that. Yeah. Oh, okay, because uh, I was a bit worried that if maybe uh, the system is left idle for some time, then uh, it means the aerobic bacteria will die off and maybe once uh, somebody, maybe the schools resume, then uh, you might be in trouble because the system might fail because the aerobic bacteria are dead. Yeah, so I said we, even if schools are closed, the machine is never switched off because for us, aeration is key. Already in the aeration chamber, there is a constant biomass that is always at the, you will see in my next presentation. We have, oh. it looks like sludge. That one is always retained in the aeration chamber. So even if there is no more sewer coming in, that yeah. one is always aerated. And when the sewer volumes reduce, our PLC is smart enough to even assume an eco-mode aeration. It doesn't consume power unnecessarily, aerating as if it was aerating the full capacity. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Troy, is there another hand? Then I think I should continue. And because I'll, I see, I think more than 10 people have just joined in. For those who had watched the video, I apologize. I will just play it. It's very short for the people that have joined to catch up, to understand where wastewater is coming from, where treatment is coming from. Then I go on with this other presentation. So. For now, I have to replay the video again because I believe it helps people understand. Uh, what is the difference? Uh, but there's one more question. What is the difference between your system and a biodigester? So John, you, you, Troy, you can unmute John to speak, but as he gets to speak, um, the obvious differences between the biodigester, I hope you have seen. First of all, our system, is four chambered. It takes all the waste from your house. Biodigesters, you will be told you need to separate the toilet from the other types. So you will sort of have two parallel system, one soaking away the gray water and the biodigester itself taking the black water, which is purely the water from your toilets. So it's like you have two things in your compound. 
the soaking of the gray may cause like a damp, damp uh, swampy area in your compound. Uh, the other thing you have seen, our system runs on electricity. It's electromechanical with well-designed equipment, advanced equipment. A biodigester is just a chamber. It does not have any equipment that you install inside it. Uh, so those are the main differences. And with our system, you get clear, odorless water that you can actually pump out and reuse uh, safely. So allow me to play the video. Uh, stop share. Shortly, and then we continue with the presentation. Now, last week, Citizen TV ran an eye-opening feature called Garbage Rivers in Nairobi. It showed images which showed the deplorable state of some of our main water bodies and the environmental and health risks they pose. On Her Say Tonight, we highlight the story of a woman who started a company to address that danger. Lucy Wanjiku is a water engineer who recycles wastewater into a reusable resource and here is her story. So here is the real stuff. Thank you, might collapse. <laughs> it's a stinky job but someone's got to do it. For Lucy Wanjiku, waste has become a common sight in her job. She's a water engineer who started a company that uses German technology to recycle wastewater and turn it into a reusable resource for household use and even watering the grass. The shocking fact is that whatever we call seaweed is 95% water. So if we just eliminate the 5%, that's the harmful bit, we get back 95% as water. And this water is good for lawns. People like Kenya Power would have a place where maybe we can recycle the massive volumes of sewage and use it to generate electricity. Lucy and her colleague, Emmanuel, are on a routine spot check at one of their clients' homes where they installed one of the systems supplied by her company, EcoCycle Limited. For the last five years, Lucy's company has been offering this service to its now over 100 clients. Our capital investment looks high, but when you look at what you're already spending to call the honey sucker to come and fetch out, like if one truck costs 10,000 and every month you're calling a truck, that's already 120,000. And in three years, you've already spent the same money that I would ask you to fix our system. And the benefit of ours would be you have green loans throughout the year. You, you reduce your water intake if you take it back to flush toilets. So you cut down on your water intake by about 30%. Lucy specializes in on-site wastewater treatment and recycling for reuse technology with experience of over 13 years in the automotive sector and the environmental engineering solutions sector. It's a journey she's happy she started after visiting Germany to see this technology in action. I've been lucky enough to have uh, international trainings on the soft skills side. Of, uh, in Germany, I had a lot on international leadership, uh, project management. I've been to the U.S. again on the pitching side. So I try to do the same knowledge I have gained. I do in-house transfer. And then at least the job is more exciting. With about 30% of Kenya connected to the municipal sewerage system, Lucy has seen that challenge as an opportunity to cover the remaining 70% of the country with more systems like this. I would love to have a local setup where we are assembling the stuff here and we reduce the importation. And then uh, one thing that we focus to work on is um, we are trying to cover the whole of Kenya. So as at the moment, I think we have like an installation at least at, in about 14 or 12 counties. So within the next two to three years, uh, my dream is that every county has at least like one installation. So when we are selling to someone in Busia or in Mombasa or in Mandera, we don't have to bring them to Nairobi to come and see how it works because when we are selling, seeing is believing and it makes the uh, embracing of the concept very easy. Lucy hopes more Kenyans will embrace this new concept to safeguard their health and the environment against risks that could cause irreparable damage down the line. Hmm. 
So now I continue with the presentation. So uh, in the next presentation, I'll try to delve into, so all the participants can assume now we have entered into an agreement, you want to execute an eco-cycle on-site treatment uh, plant. So what does it entail? Troy, I hope my screen is visible and people can hear me. Yes, it's visible. Okay. So um, the concept that our system embraces is called the SBR treatment process, which means sequential batch reactor process. And uh, through the previous presentation that uh, we have been showing, you see our system chamber is divided into four chambers. So I will explain what the four chambers are, what is the purpose of the four chambers. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, in the first chamber, we receive the treated water, we call it uh, the pretreatment, and then it overflows to a second chamber that is called the um, buffer chamber. So, in between those two chambers, it's a matter of flow equalization, holding, and separation of the non biodegradables so they do not propagate into the aeration chamber. So, then we have the third chamber that is called the aeration chamber. Uh, sorry, let me just use another document to explain that. I realize this one does not have. Yes, I've gotten your part. I want to know in a combination of both the industrial and the homes that are like that. But as I have answered, the process to treat industrial is different from the process to treat aerobic. So even if you are to say you're doing a project that combines both, it means within mm -hmm. your within your system you'll have you'll have uh, com like you'll have separated the two even if it is one large system there will be the section dealing with industry and the section dealing with the residential because the residential, yeah. biological aeration yet industrial would require things like electrolysis or chemical dosing mm. which we don't need in biological so and in any in a good design if you're designing a hospital or a factory the good design is that you separate the two. And yeah. the sense behind that is because the treatment process might be different. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. So do we have any hands up, Troy? Because I think we can wind up. No, I can't see. Just unmute everyone in case anyone has something to say. Say bye no questions. It means uh, we are clear, okay. we have been understood. We will invite you to our future webinars and thank you so much for attending. Keep following us on our Twitter handles and we have a lot of information on our website. So thank you everyone. I'll be ending the meeting now.